This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our guests are Yarimar Bonilla, associate professor uh, at Rutgers University uh, of Caribbean Studies uh, uh, and uh, visiting fellow at the Russell Sage Foundation, author of Non-Sovereign Futures. We're also joined by Naomi Klein, uh, who is now a senior correspondent at The Intercept, and we'll link to her piece called The Battle for Paradise. Juan? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to continue the discussion we were having before about the uh, the impact of the Puerto Rican diaspora on this whole debate. Uh, I remember back uh, quite some time ago, when I was back in the Young Lords in 1971, we began organizing from New York City in Puerto Rico, uh, in El Caño, in Santurce, in Aguadilla. Uh, at the time, we always used to tout that one-third of the Puerto Rican nation lived in the United States, and there was two-thirds still on the island. Uh, but yet we were sort of rejected by the elite of Puerto Rico, who called us uh, uh, Yankees, you know, that we were coming back to try to—, to uh, uh, intervene in their, in, in their social struggle. Now, five-eighths of the Puerto Rican people are living in the United States, uh, and only three-eighths in Puerto Rico. There's been, in that period of 40 years, a, um, a huge shift uh, in the population here in the United States. What's the impact of that Puerto Rican population in the U.S. with what's going on in Puerto Rico right now? Yeah, it's really interesting, because there has been a shift, like you said. There was a time when the diaspora was um, discouraged from getting involved politically in, in the political status of Puerto Rico and the future of Puerto Rico, and uh, recriminated for not speaking enough Spanish and for not, you know, be being Puerto Rican enough in some sense or another. So there is a positive change in that sense, where now there's people who don't even want to talk about diaspora, they just want to talk about Puerto Ricans here. And and there and everywhere, um, but at the same time, it's tr it's troubling how now uh, the the government is mobilizing the diaspora, but not necessarily to the same kind of political ends mm -hmm. that uh, uh, of the original kind of movements of the 60s and 70s. And so now the idea is that the diaspora is more diverse economically and and, and politically. Uh, there, and now the diaspora is in some ways by by certain. Uh, you know, folks within the statehood party uh, used as an example of the the positive aspects of being part of the U.S. So, look, you can retain your your culture and your your traditional ties while still you know speaking English and being you know a full citizen and voting. And so, it, it, it's an actually. Uh, has some positive aspects, but also some kind of troubling elements in terms of how the diaspora is being imagined. But I think uh, with Maria, the the diaspora has been such an important political force um, and so important in the recovery. Many of, of the first responders, in a way, were folks from the diaspora who just sent things directly to their family members and their friends and got on planes themselves and took so much, you know, so much aid. So I do think there's going to be a rethinking of what the role of the diaspora. Will be, but but in some sense, there's also going to be a battle over the what politically the diaspora is, is going to mean. So let's go back to this story that we started with. Uh, I want to go to a clip from an upcoming video produced by The Intercept that our guest Naomi Klein um, uh, follows her on her recent trip to Puerto Rico. In the clip, we hear from two environmental activists, Jesus Vasquez and Katia Viles, about, uh, talking about food security. Puerto Rico became a U.S. colony in 1898. During the 40s, there was a very strong oh. push to get well, people out of poverty, and poverty became directly equated with being peasant, with being a farmer. So the idea was to break down rural communities, get people to the cities, get them in cement homes, and at the same time, see how we could benefit or, or how the U.S. could benefit from Puerto Rican production of goods that were consumed in the U.S., they start pushing large-scale coffee plantations, large-scale sugar plantations. Puerto Rico has uh, this situation that, it, uh, in, in terms of food security, we're, we're very insecure because we import a lot of food. Uh, more than 80 percent of our food comes from abroad, right, by the port of San Juan. And we've always been saying with, within our movement that that's a problem, right, because of climate change, right? We can have something happen with that port and then we'll be doomed. Maria highlighted that within a night, the next night, we didn't have food, we didn't have water, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have anything. A lot of conventional farmers right now are starving, even though they have amazing amount of land, they didn't have anything to harvest because they had followed the Department of Agriculture's 
instructions for monocultures of coffee, whereas before a traditional agroecological farm would be intercropped with oranges, with bananas, with plantains, and that provides for your family. That next day, agroecological farmers were back to the land. We had farmers already ready to sell at the markets. We can feed the people um, with sustainable practices that do not harm the environment, that promote resilience within the farm and within the community. We knew that was possible even before Maria, and this is also a moment for us to reflect and also make it more visible. Those were environmental activists Jesu Vasquez and Katia Aviles talking uh, with Naomi Klein. Naomi, talk, talk uh, more about what you learned about the battle in agriculture right now in Puerto Rico and what the what the signs of hope for a new direction are. Katia and Jesus uh, work with this uh, a wonderful organization uh, called Organización Boricua. Um, they have been advocating for a very long time for food security, for a shift to away from this extreme dependence on imports. 85 percent um, of, of the food that Puerto Ricans eat is, is imported, and 90 percent of it comes through this single port, the port of, of San Juan, which was in absolute chaos after Maria. Um, and this is why a lot of people who I talked to in Puerto Rico referred sort of casually to Hurricane Maria as our teacher, <laughs> this very stern teacher. But the, but but there there were all of these lessons uh, carried by the storm of what didn't work and also some things that did work. So what didn't work, as I said earlier, was pretty much everything. This very centralized import dependent food and energy system. But there were also examples of things that did, including the model of agriculture, agroecology, that has been advanced by uh, Organización Boricua for a very long time. Um, and we met them thanks to uh, a delegation coming from, from the U.S. mainland, uh, organized by the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, but the story that they were telling there is that on farms that use these more traditional methods of intercropping, so not not planting a single monocrop, cash crop that was just leveled by Maria, um, but using these seeds and these methods that uh, protect, protected against erosion, but also planted a diversity of crops, including a lot of root vegetables that survived Hurricane Maria. So some of the only people with food stores after Hurricane Maria um, sent the whole system into chaos were farms that had planted root vegetables that were able to harvest them very, very quickly, and they had nutritious food. Meanwhile, FEMA wasn't getting to remote communities um, for, in some cases, weeks. And then when they finally arrived, they had boxes filled with Skittles and Cheez-It crackers. Um, so this is another um, example of what the reconstruction should look like if we actually learned the lessons carried by Maria. And, and Yarima, this whole issue of the fact that Puerto Rico has had to, as a result of colonialism, import so much food, when the reality is that anyone who's been to the island knows that it's so fertile that fruits grow wild everywhere on the island. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that was really, you know, made clear. N Naomi points to it so clearly in, in her piece, that this juncture between the kind of rich local food that people were still able to get, because, you know, it's just, I think it's really important to say that, that Puerto Ricans have, have, have been in this uh, crisis for over six months, and there has not been r rioting, there has not been violence, you know. Uh, folks have, have adapted and managed to take care of themselves in the face of a state that has completely abandoned them, thrown paper towels at them, thrown Skittles at them, <laughs> thrown all manner of inappropriate, you know, items. And so th there was a kind of a very sharp contrast, and people, they didn't want the military food. Uh, that FEMA was was distributing, uh, folks. You know, a lot of people tried it and then decided to just go back to eating their their yuca and then their you know the things that they were able to get in those days. You know, when we went down to Puerto Rico right after the storm, we stayed in this dark house in San Juan, no electricity. Right next door to it was a little um, Airbnb, uh, little hotel, uh, bed and breakfast. 
completely solar powered. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And then all the neighbors were saying, hey, we want to get those solar powers to that solar power too. And I wanted to ask Naomi about 98 percent of the electricity is from fossil fuels that are imported, um, no domestic supply of oil, gas and coal, all these fuels imported, as well as almost entirely Puerto Rico is reliant on food imports, despite what you both are describing right here. And as we wrap up, um, do you see, and I want to ask you both this question, a completely new grid being discussed? Well, instead, we're hearing talk of privatization, which, frankly, is linked to this cryptocurrency mania, because, of course, if you are um, thinking about relocating your business to Puerto Rico, as Yarimar said, you want to make sure you have, you know, access to your data, um, which is intimately linked to this push to have a privatized electricity grid, which many Puerto Ricans are very afraid is not going to be accessible to a lot of poor Puerto Ricans, that it will cater to these uh, so-called Portopians who are coming in. Um, and, uh, and, and there should be a huge amount of discussion going on right now about how Puerto Rico can power itself from the sun, from the wind, from the waves, which are all abundant, unlike fossil fuels, about how to do it in a way that keeps the power, the political power, um, the jobs, the skills in communities and gives people a reason to stay. Yeah, you know, one thing that hasn't been discussed, you know, the, the, the governor said blockchain is going to be central to the future. A lot of people and are— explain, Again, explain what blockchain is. Well, a, a blockchain is the ledger system that powers, you know, makes, makes it possible to make Bitcoin, right? It's not Bitcoin. It kind of allows it. Um, so if, you, if, you know, Napster allowed people to exchange music, so, you know, but there are other things that you could do through, through a kind of system like Napster. So a lot of people are—, are in the tech industry are saying that blockchain is the future to renewable energy. And so I, I suspect it has not been said directly, but I suspect that part of why blockchain is also so centrally invested in what's happening in Puerto Rico is that they want to be at the center of turning towards renewable resources. Because renewable sounds really great, but they're all there are a lot of forms of green capitalism and in green imperialism, right? And so that's I, I think what I find most troubling. And already there was a report that had come out in Puerto Rico about how certain solar power and uh, companies were taking advantage of Puerto Ricans, selling them deficient products, um, hooking them into a, a, a system, that, a long-term system, where they didn't have batteries, they didn't have uh, their, their own kind of independence. And so I fear that there's going to be a kind of greenwashing of the, you know, the, the, the new energy solutions that are going to be put into place that are going to pretend to look like something similar to what's happening at Casa Pueblo, but are, in fact, going to be driven by completely different interests and are not going to be the, the, the idea, you know, mi micro sounds great, but there are lots of different forms of being micro. And so I, I really think it's troubling that it's not people like Arturo Masol who are who have the ear of the governor, but rather blockchain industry leaders that are setting the terms of what this recovery is going to look like. Well, uh, we have 30 seconds, Naomi, as you return and, of course, wrote this seminal book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, your final thoughts. I guess my final thoughts is that amidst all of um, this bleak news, one of the most hopeful things that's going on in Puerto Rico is that Puerto Ricans are organizing against disaster capitalism and are advancing their own alternatives. Um, I would encourage people to find ways to support uh, these community-run uh, initiatives. And there's also a coalition of 60 organizations that has just formed called Junta Gente, the people together who are putting forward their own people's platform for a just recovery. So stay tuned. Um, we'll be uh, writing and well, talking about ways to support. And thank you so much, Naomi Klein, senior correspondent for The Intercept, her latest piece, The Battle for Paradise. And thank you so much to Yadamar Bonilla, uh, her latest piece in The Nation. Uh,